So we're going to begin now. It's 11.05. Uh, today I'm going to talk about microgreens. And um, my expectations for this presentation is to give you the confidence uh, for you to grow microgreens, either if you want to do it by your, uh, for your own consumption, for your own good, uh, or if you want to do it commercially. Uh, and you will see that the, presentations will have, the presentation will have a slide for some slides that are aimed for people who want to grow them themselves, and some slides are aimed for people who want to do it commercially. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to begin by defining what are microgreens. Um, so people tend to confuse the terms uh, sprout microgreens and baby greens. And what these terms refer, uh, they talk about the growth stage of the plants. So sprouts, um, you can see there in the picture, on the left are plants that are harvested when the seed germinates. As soon as the as the root emerges from the seed and the and the top part of the plant starts to mesh with the seed, that's when you harvest sprouts and you eat the whole thing. You eat the seeds and the roots. And it usually takes between two uh, zero to seven days to harvest sprouts. Now microgreens, uh, you harvest them when you start to see the first to through leaves. Now, when a plant germinates, you'll notice that um, in this picture that you see there in the middle, uh, you see the different plant tissues, you see a central stem, you see the cotyledon leaves, and you see the true leaves. The first thing that comes out of that seed when it uh, germinates, those are not the true leaves. Those are the cotyledon leaves. Those are um, part of the seeds um, that true leaves come after. So that's the second set of leaf, uh, leaves that come out of that plant are the true leaves. So when those true leaves um, expand, that's when you harvest a microgreen. Now a baby green uh, is when you let that plant develop even further and you have more um, leaves come out. Uh, and a full mature plant is if you let it grow um, what it normally takes um, to reach maturity. Um, so the main difference is how many days um, have gone by when you harvest them. Sprouts takes between zero to seven days. Microgreens, it takes between 10 to 21 days on average. And it will depend on the plant uh, species that you're growing and how long it will take uh, to harvest those. But keep in mind is when you first see the true leaves emerge and develop, that's when you harvest them. Now, this slide is aimed towards people who want to grow it for themselves. Um, gives you some benefits about uh, growing the microgreens versus buying it from the store. Now, when you grow it yourself, you control all aspects of the crop production. So you trust that the product that you're consuming is, uh, it was handled the best you could. Now, when you buy it from the store, you trust that the people who grew that crop grew it to make sure that it was safe. And you trust that the people who are handling it at the store are making sure that you're getting the best quality out of it. Um, with, when you grow it yourself, you get it the fresh product, the freshest you can get it um, in the store. You don't know how long that has been on the, st on the shelf. More importantly, you don't know how, mo how long that product has been um, on the um, storage area. Over time, uh, the, nut the nutritional content of microgreens will decrease after you harvest them. So when you grow it yourself, you know that you're getting the best nutritional value out of the, out of the microgreens. Um, also, your costs are your are um, your costs are lower, so you're getting the best price versus buying it from the store. It can be very expensive to buy microgreens. Um, now, why grow them? And this slide is more aimed towards commercial growers, um, or if you uh, want to do it as a side income. So it's a high value crop. Uh, I've seen some prices that go between 30 to $50 per pound of fresh white. Um, in some markets, it can be higher or it can be lower. This is an average price. But you see there, there's an asterisk there after the word weight. And that's just, um, I wanna make sure that you understand that it depends on your market. There are some markets that are not willing to pay that much for microgreens. Um, so you have to understand what the market you're going to buy to is. You, have, you want to know what your client, who your client is, and you want to know what is their purchasing um, 
capabilities. Uh, it's a superfood with growing market demand, and that means that it has high nutritional value. And we're gonna talk about it later on, what this means. Um, you have different varieties you can choose. Uh, they can be used to enhance uh, dishes. Uh, for example, I love to put microgreens on my burgers. They taste really well. I prefer that over having a piece of lettuce on my burgers. Um, you can eat them as salads or you, you can add them as aromatics for uh, anything you're doing. It's a fast turnover crop. It takes between 10 to 21 days to uh, harvest it. So that means that per year, you can have a bunch of crop cycles. Uh, you can use, grow them as a side income. Um, now, if you're growing them indoors, they're very versatile. I mean, you, can, you don't need to own land to grow microgreens. You can do it on a rack and you can still grow them and make a profit out of it. Um, now, I put here relatively low inputs and resources requirement, and that's based on the land requirement that you need, you need to own land to grow them. But if you're growing them indoors, your energy costs are going to increase because you need to provide lights and airflow that crop. Uh, now, uh, this slide is just showing you um, how much it costs in average. Um, to grow these uh, microgreens. And most of the information in this presentation came from research projects done by people at Cornell University, Neil Matson. Uh, some is from people at Penn State, uh, Francisco de Gioia, and from personal experience because I've grown some for uh, myself and for, for some research. So um, this is the breakdown of the costs without including seeds. Uh, the reason why I'm not including the, the seed cost is not included there because it varies for variety. Different varieties will have different costs, but uh, you notice that the, you notice there that the most, um, the highest um, that part of that away. is labor. Um, and this is just a table that they provided uh, from Cornell University. Um, you can ignore uh, the first columns here. Uh, but if you look at uh, the last two columns, it tells you what the revenue is per square meter. When you have a price of $66 per gram, and when you have a price of $110 per uh, kilogram. Uh, and this is the net income after taking out the cost per square meter. That's how, how, that's how much money you can make out of a square meter with microgreens. Uh, if you grow in greenhouse or in high tunnels, you know that that's the way people uh, look at revenue in greenhouses in um, high tunnels, how much you make per square feet or per square meter. Um, now, there are nutritional, benef nutri nutritional benefits to consuming microgreens. Uh, we know nowadays consumers have access to a lot of information and they're very informed. Now they're very concerned about what they eat and they want to make sure that the food that they're eating are um, healthy and not empty calories. We know that plants, uh, plant-based diets are good for your health because they have health protective effects, especially with microgreens. The mineral content in microgreens is between 1.1, 1.2 times and two times greater than the mature plants. It seems like when a plant matures, uh, these um, minerals get diluted in the plant tissue. Um, microgreens also have higher amounts of phytonutrients uh, than mature plants. And for some of you, the word phytonutrients <laughs> will be a new word. Phytonutrients are compounds that are good for your health. That's what they are. And these are some phytonutrients that you can find in plants. Um, there's more. Uh, these are just um, something that I put together just to show you. Uh, we have um, vitamin C, vitamin K, beta carotenes, um, glucoraphanins, and glucobrasase. I don't know how to pronounce that. <laughs> uh, glucobrasase and anthocyanins. So uh, we know that these compounds help you, let's say, for example, vitamin C. It helps you fight infections uh, and it helps with uh, tissue metabolism. Uh, vitamin K, it's essential for wound healing and blood coagulation. Uh, vitamin A is a precursor, uh, well, beta carotene is a precursor of vitamin A. Now, the last two, 
compounds are really interesting, um, especially the glucorafanins uh, and glucoprasacin. Um, they, there has been some uh, research done on, the, on, the, on those compounds, and they have found evidence or some link that they may help uh, prevent chronic diseases uh, such as cardiovascular diseases, obesity, and cancers, um, certain types of cancer. Anthocyanins are antioxidants. I don't know if you heard that term before, but these are compounds that help uh, prevent oxidation of cells. It helps you with aging. Uh, it reduces coronary disease, uh, and some of them has uh, anti-cancer properties. Now, the reason I put this here is because, like I mentioned earlier, in general, microgreens have higher concentration of these compounds uh, than the mature plants. I'm showing you here a table, and you can use this information um, for your marketing purposes. If you're gonna be a commercial grower of microgreens, you can put this in your label. Just make sure that you, what you're putting in your label is backed up by science. You cannot say that microgreens will help you um, fight a disease that hasn't been proved. Um, this table is just a summary of some um, compounds. Uh, this is based on some research. Um, the list of microgreen crops is growing. So expect this table to, um, um, in, um, to be longer um, because there's more research being done with this. But in general, I want you to notice that often and most of the time, microgreens have higher concentration uh, of these health promoting compounds than the mature plants. Now there's different systems that you can grow microgreens. You can grow them outdoors on the soil, uh, but the main issues there is that um, you need to um, be careful of diseases, pests, and contamination. Uh, there may be a bird flying around and the bird may decide to poop and that can land on your microgreens and you lost that part. So there's higher risks when you grow them outdoors. You can do it, but keep in mind that there's higher risks. Um, you have less energy and input requirement. Uh, you can grow them in protective structures. Now think that when you have a high tunnel or a greenhouse, that space costs some money. So space comes at a premium there. If you're heating the greenhouse, you have higher energy and input requirements and a higher investment. Now, when you're growing in greenhouse, you have more control over things. You have less disease pressure and uh, insect uh, pressure. And then contamination, it doesn't depend on wildlife. In the, it depends on how well you train your, your, the people working in the greenhouse, the risk of contaminating your produce. And you can grow them indoors. Uh, you see the container there on the right part of the picture there. There's a picture from a friend in Florida. He buys those containers and he retrofits them to grow microgreens uh, in them. Uh, now your energy inputs are gonna increase because you have to provide light. Uh, and you have to make sure that there's good air circulation and you have higher control over disease, diseases, pests, and contamination. Um, that arrow there is just uh, showing the level of control. You have higher control when you grow indoors versus outdoors. And the only thing that you have to think about is that your land requirements, you need to own land if you're going outdoors and growing in a protective structure versus indoors, you can do that in a spare room that you have in your house. Now, these are the materials that you need uh, to grow microgreens. You need the seeds. Um, Growing media, it can be potting mix or fiber mats or coconut core. Uh, you need good quality water. Uh, we're gonna talk about it later. Uh, sometimes you might need lights, um, trays, 21-5-20 uh, fertilizer. Uh, and uh, that's from a research project where someone tried different fertilizers and they found out that if you're using constant liquid feed, feed um, that was the best fertilizer to use. Um, with microgreens. Uh, and you need a growing rack or a bench to grow them if you're growing them in a greenhouse or indoors. We're going to talk about these cultural practices, crop, what crops you can grow as microgreens, uh, which growing media, uh, the growing temperature, light, and fertilization. 
So with crop selection, um, when I was preparing for this uh, presentation, I was gonna look at the different crops and make a table, but I saw that someone already did it. <laughs> so John and C, they have a good resource about it and they have this list of microgreens that they sell. And what I like about this table is that it tells you, uh, it breaks it down between herbs and flowers and vegetables. But it also separates the ones that are fast growing, slow growing um, microgreens. And it gives you information about what um, they use it for. I like that they give you uh, um, um, some pictures on how the microgreens should look when you harvest them. Um, they're adding new varieties uh, every time. So you can access this information using that thing. Uh, I'm going to share the presentation at the end of the. Um, I'm going to share this presentation with you later. Um, so now that we talked about what crops you can grow microgreens, we can um, move on to growing media. So what's the ideal growing media? I mean, you can use potting mixes and fiber mats, but it all depends on how you what you have locally available. Um, you're not gonna use something that's gonna cost you too much money to bring just because I showed it in the presentation. You have to make sure what you have in your market available for you to use. It has to be relatively inexpensive. Um, preferably, if you wanna, if you if you are into being sustainable from renewable sources, and that takes out peat peat moss because it's not su uh, sustainable. Um, you have to have a media that retains water and air. Um, should have a pH between 5.5 and 6.5, and electrical conductivity below 0.5 decisiemens per meter. And now this is important with coconut uh, fiber media because uh, the coconut media is a byproduct of the coconut fiber industry. And sometimes they treat the coconut fibers with salts and salts increase the electrical conductivity a lot. So you have to make sure that the person you're buying the coconut fiber is uh, tells you what's the EC of that product. And it has to be microbiologically safe. You don't want to risk contaminating your product. So that means that you are not going to use uh, composted manure uh, to grow um, microgreens. And it has to be something that's easy to dispose, um, recyclable or biodegradable, or that you can reuse. Uh, now there's a table here uh, comparing the different uh, growing medias. Uh, I know there's a lot of information there, but the things that I want you to focus on right now is um, that water holding capacity of them and the irrigation frequency, when you have potting mixes, they retain a lot of water. That means that you don't have to water them that frequently. Now fiber mats, uh, all the fiber mats, they're really thin but that means they're not gonna hold that much water. So that means that you have to be on top of them. You have to water them frequently. Uh, nutrient content, some potting mixes come uh, preloaded with fertilizer in them. Uh, and we're gonna see how that affects crop production. When you're using fiber mats, they don't have any fertilizer added to them. So you have to add the fertilizer yourself. Um, so this is, what I want to show you here with this table, I have a cost here, but this is not um, that important because it will depend on where you are and what your market is, um, what you have available. It may change from place to place. Microbial quality, this paper was um, done by DeJoya from Penn, he's in Penn State right now. And he looked at the amount of uh, microbes in each potting, uh, in potting media versus fiber mats. And you see that potting mix have more microbes, but that doesn't mean that it's a bad uh, growing media. Um, that means that there's, um, the potting mixes are from an organic source. So obviously there's gonna, they're gonna su support more microbial uh, life. That doesn't mean they're bad for you and not all microbes are bad for you. The only thing that you have to, uh, consider when you're using potting mixes is that you have to be careful when you're handling the products, when you're harvesting them. Make sure that you're not contaminating what you harvest or that you wash your microgreens after you harvest them. Now, if we're using potting mix, how much to use? 
this is from Cornell, and they looked at the different um, a different um, depths uh, of polymix, and they found out that the best um, um, depth was around two inches. You get the best uh, out of polymixes. Uh, if you go higher, yeah, you can increase a little bit more, but um, you're spending more money in putting mix. Um, and if you go lower, then you lose money because your plants are not growing. It's just a fresh way here. Uh, and around two inches is a good depth if you're using putting mixes. And here's just showing the dry weight. Um, this is fresh weight, and on the left, right side is the dry weight of the plants. And you can see that uh, the deeper you go, the more dry weight. Um, but I will focus more on the fresh way because that's why you sell to the market. Um, that's how you sell your product. Now, what to use, potting mixes or fiber mats? Um, so I'm just gonna break down some of the considerations. Uh, you, can use, you can use either of those, um, but you have to think that your management will change if you use one or the other. So we know that potting mixes, you, you're using two inches of potting mixes, of potting mix per tray. That means that you're gonna hold a lot of water. And that means that you don't have to water it as frequently as you water uh, fiber mats because they don't hold that much water. Um, potting mixes have fertilizer. Some of them have fertilizer in them. So that means that the germination is gonna be quick and the, grow, and the plants are gonna grow quicker than um, growing with fiber mat fiber mats without fertilizer. Um, and I've grown some microgreens and I, there's a significant difference when you're growing um, microgreens with potting mix that doesn't have fertilizer, well, potting mix with fertilizer versus fiber mats. Um, potting mixes are, have organic components in them, so obviously they're gonna support more microbial life than fiber mats. But the only thing that you have to think about is how you handle the produce. That doesn't mean that they're bad. If you have um, a rack that's not that heavy, like a um, growing rack, potting mixes are bulky and heavy when wet, um, and fiber mats are light when wet. Uh, shelf life, if you cut fresh um, microgreens, they let the, uh, the nutritional content of them, you can guarantee that for 10 days if you keep it at um, five degrees Celsius or 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, with fiber mats, I like that you can cut the mat and put that in a clamshell and you're selling living, uh, living plants. So that's why I have shelf life there with a question mark because uh, you can uh, sell the fresh products with fiber mats. Now temperature, uh, air temperature, when you're growing microgreens, um, we have here a graph, this is from the Cornell study, and you see that the warmer you get in temperature, the, lo um, the shorter the growing period, the growing period, the days to harvest are shorter. So keep in mind that when you're growing microgreens, you, wanna, you don't wanna keep it, you don't wanna keep them below 20 degrees Celsius, which is around six, which is 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the maximum temperature, uh, that you can grow this is at 29 degrees Celsius or 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And the reason why you, wanna, you don't wanna go over that is because um, with warmer temperatures, you increase disease pressure. Uh, and in some varieties, you inhibit germination. Um, light, uh, just think that sunlight is free. You're not gonna spend money using sunlight. But if you're growing indoors or you need lights, there are two options that you can um, use. You can either use LED lamps or fluorescent lamps. And the reason why is because these lamps, when you turn them on, they don't, they're not hot. That means that you can put them close to the plants. If you're using incandescent bulbs, they emit heat and they can burn your plants. Um, now you have to evaluate how the lights um, spread out how the fixture of the light spread light, so you can uh, figure out how you arrange them when you grow microgreens. And you also have to think about the cost of these lights, not just the cost of buying the lights, but the cost of running them. Uh, here I have this um, picture here that I can show you to talk about it. 
Uh, let's talk about costs. When you buy the light, you think, uh, just keep in mind that sunlight is free. Fluorescent lights are gonna be more expensive than, more. they're gonna be cheaper than LED lights. LED lights are gonna be expensive. However, when you compare fluorescent lights versus uh, LED lights, LED lights are much more efficient at using electricity. That, that means that your electrical bill is gonna be lower with that. Now your level of control is gonna be higher with lights compared with sunlight, because what will happen if you are trying to grow microgreens in a greenhouse or in a high tunnel and you're in the rainy season? That means that you're not gonna get enough lights. So if you wanna be commercial growers um, with microgreens and you have a greenhouse or a high tunnel, you should consider investing in some lights for those days that you're not gonna be able to have enough sunlight to grow them. Now what happens when you add light? Uh, we have two graphs here. Uh, we know that light uh, decreases the days to harvest and increases weight. Um, we have here the, the amount of light that you added to the microgreens and you see that the, the fresh weight increases when you add light. And then in this graph here, we have the days to harvest. Uh, you see when you add lights to the, uh, to the plants, you see that the days to harvest of different microgreens, they go down. So that means that you're gonna harvest them um, quicker and your growing period will be shorter. Um, so the recommendation here is to provide between 12 to 16 hours of light per day. Now, some people will ask about the light quality because some of you may have heard about Oh, use red lights, use blue lights, use green lights. Well, we know that red light in any plant, they promote growth. Blue light, they promote the accumulation of nutrients, uh, those phytonutrients that we uh, talked about earlier. So what growers do is that sometimes they'll just apply a light treatment at the end of the season, just to promote the accumulation of those beneficial nutrients. Now, when you're buying a light, uh, we have, you see these uh, graphs here at the bottom of this slide. When you're buying a light, um, the box or the instructions will give you what kind of light this is. Now, when plants use blue light and red lights for photosynthesis, so a light will, be like this, the first one on the left side is a um, full spectrum light. And you can see that it emits blue light and it also emits yellow to red lights. It emits both of them. Now, the one in the middle is considered a blue light because it emits more blue light than it emits red light. So this will be considered a blue light. The one on the right side, it's a red light. Uh, you see there's more, it emits more red than it emits blue lights. So if you wanna be technical about it, um, you can play with the lights, uh, but just keep in mind that you're gonna sell the microgreen for the same price as someone that grew them with um, full spectrum light. So you, you, you cannot go wrong if you're using full spectrum light. Um, and this is just um, a trial that this company called Lumigrow uh, did. And what they did is, is that they, so they had different crops and they, uh, put different light treatments, like 84% of the time they grew with red light and then they did 16% of the time with blue lights. And they saw these effects um, with um, lights. Now fertilizer, uh, we know when, when I started getting into microgreens, my thought was like, ah, we're just germinating plants. Um, and we're just letting them grow to, you see the first two uh, leaves. So you don't need fertilizer. That was my initial thought when I was getting into microgreens. But then microgreens, they respond to fertilizers. Um, so this is from that study in Cornell and we had the concentration, the fertilizer concentration here, and we had the fresh weight per cell. And look what happens when you, when you don't have um, fertilizer and then you're, your yields are really low. Now, when you start adding fertilizer to these uh, plants, you see that your yields increase. Um, and the sweet spot for fertilizer is to provide between 100 and 100 milligrams of nitrogen per liter of nutrient solution. 
uh, of the irrigation water that you're doing. Uh, this is also uh, shown as parts per million nitrogen. If you look at <laughs> fertilizer recommendations, that's how you're going to see them as parts per million nitrogen. Uh, now, um, we see that the increase, like let's say you go from 50 to 100, you increase um, a lot of, uh, your, your yield increases a lot. But then when you go from 150 to 200, it doesn't increase that much. So if you think, uh, I'm just going to add more than 150 uh, parts per million nitrogen, yeah, you can do that, but the plants are not using it. So it's, uh, you're wasting money at that point when you're adding more than the plant needs to grow. So in conclusion, when, with the cultural practices, you need to provide uh, 12 to 16 hours of light because it increases the fresh weight and it decreases the days to harvest. Uh, keep the temperatures uh, over 20 uh, degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. If you're using potting mixes, um, use around two inches of potting mixes. Um, now fiber mats, um, they can be an alternative. For, you can use those instead of potting mixes, but see here, I have an asterisk here. You need to use fertilizer when you're using fiber mats. Um, and you can ha you use a constant uh, liquid feed of uh, fertilizer at 150, 100 to 150 parts per million nitrogen. And what constant liquid feed means is that the irrigation water that you're using has the fertilizer. Now, let's talk about the steps that you need to do to uh, grow microgreens. Um, I have here sow seeds, but if you're using fiber mats, make sure that you soak them in water overnight, uh, especially when, when you're working with um, hemp mats. Those are hard to get um, moist. So you have to soak, soak them overnight in water. And with hemp mats, you have to treat them like a sponge. You have to squeeze them and make sure that the water gets in them. Um, then you can start sowing the seeds. Um, you need to cover some seeds. You, you have to read the instructions of the seeds also. Uh, some seeds require you to cover them for 24 to 48 hours with a damp newspaper. I, I use a damp newspaper. Uh, avoid covering them with a the potting mix because then you have to remove the cover. And if you use potting mix, it's gonna be hard to remove the potting mix from each seed in the tray. Um, you can prepare a nutrient solution uh, using 150 parts per million nitrogen. And I'm giving you a recipe there. Uh, add one ounce of the 21,520 fertilizer per, uh, for each 10 gallons of water. Uh, ideally, you want to water from underneath sub irrigate. Because if you uh, irrigate from above, you run into the risk of washing off the seeds and moving them around. And also, um, Sub irrigation uh, is better to prevent uh, for preventing diseases uh, from uh, happening on the leaves. And if when you have a full grown microgreen tray, if you water from above, it's going to be hard for that water to go down uh, into the roots because the leaves are the, the canopy, the leaves are going to prevent that water from reaching the roots. Um, after the 48 hours or 24 hours, you remove the cover. Um, and you can just grow the plants and you harvest them uh, when you have the first two true leaves appear. Um, and you can enjoy them or package them for sale. Now let's talk about the steps, uh, sowing seeds. Uh, how much seed to put um, on the tray? So it depends on the seed size. Uh, small seeds, um, as a rule of thumb, you can put uh, 10 to 12 small seeds per square inch. Um, as, um, and for large seeds, you can put six to eight seeds per square inch. And here I have a picture of different seeds. Um, anything that's uh, the size of a bead or larger, you use the large seeds. And anything that's below a radish, use the small seeds recommendation there. Um, now, when you look online at seeding densities, some recommendations are based on uh, weight. How much, how many grams or ounces you're going to put per tray. And this is from Johnny Seeds. Uh, they use a 10-20 tray as a standard. 
And a 1020 tray is a tray that's 10 inches uh, wide, uh, wide by 20 inches long. And they tell you what's the, um, how many grams of seed to put per tray and what was the yield. And this was based on a trial that they did and this is the best, uh, the, the best yield that you could get and the lowest days to maturity using these um, seed densities. Um, now, how you put, uh, now this is from Cornell also, uh, and they're looking at the seed density and the fresh weight of the, of the, of the tray. And you can see when you're putting more seeds, you increase your yields, right, up to a certain point. And the numbers that I gave you before for large and small seeds are based on these uh, research projects. Uh, but then look at what happens at the weight for each plant. So each individual plant, when you put them uh, at higher densities, they get smaller. And that's because they're competing uh, for resources in space. That's just, just what happens when you're growing microgreens with plants. But you're not, if you're growing them commercially, you're not interested in the weight per plant. You're interested in how much you can get per tray. Now, there are some density calculators there. Um, I found these online. Uh, however, when I try to see uh, where, they, where they get their information from, there's none there. I tried to find uh, the developer of these and ask them, but there's no um, contact information. So you can use these, but I don't know where they get, where they got those numbers from. Um, so uh, you, you can, you feel free to use them, but just be careful with them. Now, how do you put the seeds? And this is one of the hardest part. That's the most labor intensive process when you're growing microgreens is putting those seeds. Um, usually it's a manual process. Um, the best way to do it is to put a non quantity area. Some people just um, like to broadcast the seeds on the tray. Uh, I've seen these seeders, um, they have um, two plastic layers. You put the seeds on and then you slide one, sorry, and you slide the bottom plastic layer and the seeds fall. This is a drop seeder, uh, but then I don't think they go um, too close enough for microgreens densities. Uh, you can use um, like these kind of seeders from Johnny Seeds. What I do is I have a, um, a tray in my office that's one centimeter by one centimeter. And what I do is that large seeds, I put one seed per cell. This is a square centimeter. I put one seed per cell and for small seeds, I put four to six seeds per cell here. And that's my, the method that I prefer to use. Um, uh, automatic seeders, uh, I haven't seen one for microgreens. Uh, I've seen some six row seeders from Johnny's for lettuce in the field, but I don't know that that's, you have to roll it on the bed and that's not adapted for microgreens. Um, and keep in mind that some seeders require cover. Um, that's what I mentioned earlier. You have to read the instructions um, for uh, the seeds. Um, you can use a dark room instead of covering um, them also. Now, when you're growing the plants, um, just keep in mind that you wanna keep the media moist, but not wet. Um, you wanna avoid watering it at night and preferably, you want to water them, water the plants from underneath the trays, not overhead watering. Uh, remember the fertilizer, it helps. Uh, it shortens the growth periods and it makes the plants grow more. Um, light, we talked about light. Uh, just give them 12 to 16 hours per day, but do not leave the lights on because plants need a dark uh, period to grow. Um, harvest, like we talked earlier, you harvest when you see the first true leaves expand um, and that's when you harvest the plants. Uh, harvesting, you can use scissors, um, you can sell the whole tray to, to whoever is going to buy it or you can cut the, if you're using fiber mats, you can cut them and put them in clamshells and sell them that way. Uh, just remember that if you're starting, starting them at 
five degrees Celsius or 48, I think it's 41 or 48 degrees Fahrenheit, you, the nutritional quality is guaranteed for 10 days if you're cutting them. Uh, we don't know with live uh, with live plants how long the nutritional content is yet. I haven't seen any research um, that has answered that question for me. Um, these are just some things that you can do to lower your harvest time to make sure that your crop cycle is shorter. Keep the temperature uh, over 20 degrees Celsius or 68 Fahrenheit, but not over 85 degrees Fahrenheit. If you're using growing media, uh, use uh, two inches of potting mix, um, lights, and fertilizer. And those are the things that will make your uh, growth cycle shorter. Um, I have an example for uh, to make the fertilizer calculation. Uh, I'm going to go through it, but I already gave you a recipe, and this is how I came up with that number. So let's say an example that you're going to prepare 10 liters of nutrient solution, and that you want to give um, 10 parts per million of nitrogen using this fertilizer. Just when you're doing this calculation, just keep in mind that 100 parts per million of nitrogen is the same as saying there's 100 milligrams of nitrogen in one liter of that solution, right? In fertilizers, the numbers refer to the percent, the first number that you see in that three number series, the first number is the percent of nitrogen, the second number is the percent of phosphate, and the third number is the percent of potassium, potash in that fertilizer. All right, let's go to the step one. We need to know how much nitrogen we need for that 10 liters. So we know that for one liter of nutrient solution, we need 100 milligrams of nitrogen. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna multiply the 10 liters, your, the volume that you're gonna prepare of nutrient solution by the requirement. And you're gonna get how many milligrams of nitrogen you're gonna need for the whole tank. Now, uh, step two is we, ha we, have to know, we have to figure out how much fertilizer will cover this need. And I have this formula here, and it's a really easy formula. Um, F is, is what we're calculating, is the amount of fertilizer that we're gonna need. NR is the nitrogen that we're gonna need that we calculated in the first step. And uh, percent, percent N is the amount of nitrogen in the fertilizer. So we know that the 21520 has 21% nitrogen. So we put the numbers in, uh, but you see there's a parenthesis. Anytime you're doing a math operation, you do what's in parenthesis first. That's the first step. And then you do whatever is the, the outside. So for this example, for 10 liters, we're gonna need to add 4.7 grams of the fertilizer to have a nutrient solution that will have 100 parts per million nitrogen. Um, there are some online calculators there. I forgot to put those uh, here in the presentation. I'm gonna add the links uh, for those calculators in the presentation that I'm gonna share with you later. Uh, diseases and insects. Uh, just think about what are the growing conditions for microgreens. You have a dense crop, you have a saturated growing media, you have high air humidity and poor air circulation. These are also the conditions for diseases to happen. When you have high plant densities, you have stretchy and leggy plants, you can have mold and mildews grow. So if you see those uh, growing in your microgreens, the best thing you can do is decrease the plant density, use dehumidifiers or improve the airflow using fans. Just keep in mind that uh, decreasing the plant density is the most cost effective solution. You're not gonna use more energy if you decrease the plant density. Overwatering is a, is a common thing that can happen with microgreens. Uh, it promotes algae growth. Um, that doesn't look good. Uh, it, and algae also is a host for fungus gnats. The larvae of these gnats feed on the root on um, the plants. You have higher risk of damping off and root runs. So the way to deal with this is remember just to keep the meat moist but not saturated and avoid um, watering from above. Chemical control is limited with microgreens because the, short, the, the growth cycle is short and that means that some um, pesticides won't 
uh, degrade over um, by the time you harvest them. So cultural control and biological control are your, your best options to hunting up diseases and pests. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, this is just a list of common diseases that you can find in microgreens, damping off in root rods. And here is how you control them. Use lower media, keep the media moist but not saturated, um, and use high quality water. Avoid using surface water like water from a pond, a ditch, or a river. If you're using that surface water, you have to consider treating the water. Um, mildews and white mold. Um, you can increase air, circu air circulation, decreasing um, plant density, um, and if you're growing indoors, consider using a dehumidifier. Botrytis or gray mold, it grows when the weather is cool and wet. That's why I have here avoid watering at night. Um, and just remove the trays that have gray mold um, and get rid of them and improve air circulation. If you see leggy plants with yellow leaves, that means that there's a, the light is not enough, plant density is too high, or there are not enough nutrients for the plants to develop. And I have here that this is very common when you're growing with uh, fiber mats. Insects, it depends whether you're growing them indoors or outdoors. Indoors and in greenhouses, in the greenhouses, the most common ones are thrips. These are the ones here. Um, these are really small insects and they like to live in the, um, in the buds of the plants, in the growing parts of the plants. And this is how the damage from trips look. It, it looks like sunken white tissue uh, on the leaves. These are really hard to control and get rid of. Um, aphids are the ones here in the bottom corner. White flies, here's the egg of a white fly and a nymph. And here's how an adult looks of a white fly. Fungus gnats and shore flies. Outdoors, any animals that eat uh, leafy greens, uh, slugs, rabbits, deers, um, um, moth, uh, larvae, thrips. There's a lot of things that can um, feed on your microgreens when you're growing them all outdoors. Um, like I mentioned earlier, chemical control is not a good option for um, microgreens. You can use insecticidal soaps or horticultural oils, uh, like neem oil, but remember, you have to read the label. Uh, and if you're out of state, um, the label is the law. Each state may have different uh, restrictions on which uh, pesticides you can use uh, in greenhouses or with specific crops. Best options with uh, microgreens and insects is biological control. Um, uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about marketing. Um, just this, this is information that you have to think about when you're ready to market your product. Just think about the shelf life, uh, five to 10 days, uh, to guarantee that the nutritional content of that microgreen is at its top. Um, you can sell those as fresh cut microgreens, you can sell the trays, or you can sell the living plants. Think about your market, Think about your clients, what's their income, and the different market avenues that you can um, explore, like farmer's market, uh, restaurants, they like to buy microgreens. Restaurants is a good uh, option for selling microgreens, and grocery stores. Um, if you're gonna sell and promote your microgreens, focus, I mean, think about what are the health benefits of microgreens and put that in the label. Uh, tell people that your products is sustainable, and focus on food safety uh, also. Do you need to have a certification to grow microgreens? That depends on who you're buying, uh, who you're selling to. Um, some restaurants will tell you, are you GAP certified? Then you have to get a training for GAP certification. Um, that publication, if you go to the uh, University of Missouri Extension website in publications, and if you type this in the search bar, it will give you to this publication where it talks about um, marketing vegetables in Missouri. Um, regulations. Um, food safety, modernization are the product safety rule. Um, this is from the Department of, um, of Agriculture in Missouri. Um, they are not um, inspected, but you need to comply with the federal law. 
and this is the FISMA, the Food and Safety Modernization Act. If you're a grower that um, have a revenue over $26,000 now, I don't know, but it's $25,000 uh, based on 2012, uh, if adjusted for inflation, I don't know how much it is right now, but if you go over that in produce, you need to take a training in Food Safety Modernization Act, the Food Safety Rules. Um, and if you're interested um, in that, you can just write me an email um, and we can think about making a training um, in your area. These are the different systems you can grow. You see some of them, um, they use trays, like the NFT systems, where you can grow the microgreens, you can put the growing media. Some of them are benches. Uh, these are the pre-built systems. Some of them are racks, uh, but just look at the prices of these. Um, when I built the one that I have in my office, I went to the local hardware store, I bought this same rack and I bought the lights and I spent uh, between $300 and $400 uh, without the, um, the tank and the pump. Uh, so it's considerably cheaper if you build them yourself. Um, but if you don't have the time or the patience to do so, uh, you can just buy a pre-made system uh, from a company. Um, 